There we go. Uh, let's pray together. God, thanks for bringing us together tonight. Thank you for the, the sunshine and the continuing change of season. Uh, be with us as we look into your words uh, so that we might uh, shape our lives around you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. So we're uh, we're in First John, the first epistle of John. We spent some time last week talking about uh, we don't know which John this is, or if it, or if it is even someone named John, but uh, certainly it's somebody who writes from um, the 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 point of view of the Gospel of John. And we're going to see a couple of examples, one big example of that tonight. Um, most of us, if we know this letter, we know it because of uh, 1 John 4, 7, and 8. Uh, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love... I'm trying not to sing it this time. Uh, anyway, that's that's a very familiar passage. Uh, but First John is more uh, than that, and it's uh, as we started to unpack a little bit last week. It's a this is an argument. It is it's a letter written to people who had uh, divided the 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 community that was built around the Gospel of John. Which uh, the, the word you're going to keep hearing me say is Johannine. And it's just the it's the adjective form of John, and uh, it's the word that's used in in any writing about this literature or uh, about the Gospel of John or about this community that was built around the Gospel of John called the Johannine community. And so, um, the uh, the letter is it's an argument with a group of people, a faction of people within the Johannine community who had separated, um, who had left the community. And uh, it wasn't an argument over, uh, well, gosh, it wasn't an argument over worship music or money or any of the things people leave churches about now. Uh, it, it really was, uh, it was a doctrinal issue. It was an issue about uh, belief and what we what we believe. And so, uh, as I touched on last week, in the earliest years of the church, for the first century or so, uh, small communities or even clusters of communities, house churches uh, in cities all over um, uh, the Middle East and Turkey and into uh, Asia Minor, uh, they they gathered around the writings that they had, and clearly the guy who's writing this letter is is arguing from a point of view of the Gospel of John is the explanation for who Jesus is. So right on its face, uh, we who have the entire Bible, the the entire New Testament, we have not one gospel but four, and we also have letters from Paul and letters from Peter and a letter from James. Uh, we we have other things that have helped us round out our, our understanding of who Christ is and what we believe. But for the person who's writing 1 John, the, the issue is how far can you stray from the writings that brought us together in the first place, which in this case happened to be the Gospel of John. So I hope that part makes sense. It's uh, it, so in in one way, this is an argument that really isn't ours. But there are still things in this argument and in this series of arguments that I think make sense for us and have value for us. And so, First uh, John is a reminder of three things. And I think as you hear me say these three themes that I've uh, distilled out of the letter. Uh, you'll realize these are pretty important for us too. But the first John reminds us about who Jesus is. It reminds us how we're meant to treat each other within the community of faith, within the church. 
And it also has something to say about how we're meant to interact with the world outside the church. And so um, those things I do believe are relevant for us, even if um, some of the, the boundaries of the argument that are that's being made in the letter, even if that we can look back on and say, I get why he made these arguments, but uh, those aren't necessarily ours. So, like I said, a lot like a lot of the writings in the New Testament, First John is addressing a specific set of problems, um, and they center around that one conflict within one cluster of uh, Christian communities. And so as we look at those themes that I mentioned, who Jesus is, how we're meant to interact in the church, and how we're meant to interact with the world around us, as we look at those, we're going to see them through the eyes of the guy writing this letter as he makes this case for the Christian faith against people who wanted to change it or water it down or divide it or diminish it. Uh, I chose all those words carefully because all of those things, I think, are happening with the person that uh, that John is arguing with. So just a little riff on the kind of language that we see in the letter. Um, the writings of the Johannine community, uh, they, they were used to the writings of John. And one of the things that distinguishes the writing of the of John of the Gospel of John <clears throat> is this use of metaphor, use of uh, this kind of language, and um, a metaphor. For those of you who don't remember high school English, uh, a metaphor is a uh, a figure of speech that describes something or a person by using a word that isn't was isn't normally associated with that person or thing. So I, I found a few examples that we can look at. When you say somebody, that person's an open book. So clearly that person is not a book. Uh, it's not a collection of pieces of paper with ink on them sewn at one end. But you get what that means. It's a, it, it, it's a metaphor. It's a word that isn't usually associated with a person that's used to describe a person. Um. Uh, this one is especially important to me after a heart surgery. He wears his heart on his sleeve. Well, I can assure you that I do not. I know exactly where it is because I've seen the door. Um, or we, people will refer to the whole enchilada. Okay, you get that? There's words that that describe something or someone but they aren't really a word that describes someone. They're used as a figure of speech to, to describe that. Those are important in the Gospel of John, and those are very important in our letter. And so uh, I want to pick up um, with the Bible study now, uh, right where we left off last week. We, we talked about the first four verses of the first chapter, so I want to pick it up in... Um, verse 5. Um, and as we do that, I want us to think, what is this passage teaching us about the life of faith? What's it teaching us about the issues for the life of faith back then, but also what's it teaching us uh, now? And so we're going we're gonna to look at the claims that the writer of this letter makes and try and deduce from that what he's arguing against. See what I mean? He's going to make a case for something. So we're going to be able to kind of guess and infer a little bit about uh, what he's arguing against in that uh, in his letter. So here's uh, starting with verse five. If you have your Bibles, this is a good time to look at them, but I'm going to read these passages too. Uh, the writer says, uh, this is the message we have heard from him, meaning Jesus, and declare to you. And so the writer, right from this, the beginning of this section, is reminding the readers that there is a message that they all received that helped them form their community from the beginning. It's, uh, it's the message that, uh, that helped shape them, that informed their own journey of faith, 
And that is, um, and it's also the message that they all sort of gathered around. It was their founding document. It was for those of them, uh, especially at this point, most of them had not seen Jesus in person. They had encountered Jesus through the writings that became the Gospel of John. And so he's making the claim that that original message is the right one, is the correct one. And we can, so we can draw from that, that clearly this group that has split apart from the Johannine community is making changes uh, to the, to the heart of the Christian gospel. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to give the writer the benefit of the doubt and say that these aren't small changes. These are not oh, we wanted the building painted a different color, okay? Churches can split over those too, and I got stories for you. But um, the the point here is that uh, the people who had split apart from the community had changed something fundamental about the faith. And if we think about the themes for the letter, they they changed something fundamental about who they said Jesus was, how they were meant to interact with each other, and how they were meant to encounter the world. And so uh, the writer here is going to remind them now of what the of what he believes the true message uh, is, is to be. and and he starts with this. He says, "God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. So, if we're if you've read the Gospel of John, if you're familiar with that at all, um, your these readers would have heard then what we know now as John eight twelve, which goes like this: Jesus says, "I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life." So you see how the writer is reminding them of who Jesus is by using that same way of writing that the the that the that John uses that the gospel of John uses to describe Jesus um in in the gospel of John Jesus says I'm the light of the world whoever follows me will never walk in darkness and in uh, our letter the writer says God is light in him there is no darkness at all so we should be hearing that there's a lot, there's a lot of influence from that language. That that he's trying to tie um, the faith back to these writings of John, and trying to make sure that anybody who strays beyond that knows that they're doing it wrong. So that's a reminder that the Johannine community forms around and, and uses the 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 writings of John. And so this image of light is one of the metaphors that John is known for. And it's a common way to talk about God, even in other religions. Other religions have a sun god. Other religions uh, oftentimes worship the light uh, because it doesn't take long for a civilization to realize that light is essential for life. It helps plants grow. It it melts the snow from winter that becomes the drinking water for the rest of the year. Uh, people understood that that light, that the sun was uh, was an important part of life, and lots of religions worship the sun. Uh, and so it's a common way to talk about God in all kinds of religions, but it's also common to the Hebrew scriptures, and those did exist for everyone to read and share. Uh, during the time uh, uh, of the first century or so. Uh, there's the burning bush in Exodus, right? Here's this demonstration of light and power from God. This is where God introduces himself by name to Moses. And what is it? It's a, it's a bush that burns but isn't consumed. Uh, there's, uh, in Psalm 119, we see thy word is a lamp unto my feet. This image of light is, is common and well known to anyone in that community who would have known the Hebrew Bible. And then in Psalm 27, 
God's referred to as my light and my salvation. So this idea of light, John didn't make it up. John just picked it up and ran with it. And so this would have been a, a familiar image or metaphor uh, for the people in the Johannine community. And the second half of that line is, in him, in Jesus, uh, there is no darkness at all, no evil or hatred or untruth or ignorance or hostility. It's a pretty good grocery list, but that's that's what the writer means. And then we get to why that matters in, in the next verse, in verse 6. The, uh, the writer says, If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk, walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. I'll say it again. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. We can't walk in evil and hatred and untruth and ignorance and hostility and still claim that we're walking in the ways of God. If God is pure light, again, it's a metaphor, but it works in this teaching. If God is pure light, you can't bring darkness into that presence. You can't try and join darkness with light. This is not mixing black and white paint together and getting gray. This is more of the, the elemental function of light that, that washes darkness away. And so in the next verse, the writer gets to why this matters for us. Uh, and this is part of the teaching about how we're meant to interact both with each other uh, within the, the family of faith, but also uh, how we're meant to interact with the culture. Verse 7 says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Christian unity is a product of walking with God. Christian unity is a product of walking with God. It's impossible to have uh, unity in a community of faith when we're allowing ourselves to be guided by habits and behaviors that try and cover up God's light. Even that should remind us of one of Jesus' teachings, not in John, but in one of the other Gospels, where he says, nobody takes a light out and then puts a basket over it. You can't hide light. It's not what it's meant for. And so, we don't always get that right. <laughs> not in the first century and not in the 21st century. We don't always get that part right. And so the warning about not walking in the ways of darkness and making sure that we walk in the ways of the light, the warning for that also comes with a promise. And so in the next part of verse 7, he says, And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. That's, this is one of the central metaphors of the entire Christian message. It's the blood of Christ that, that provides our path to forgiveness and reconciliation. Um, we celebrate that in communion, right? That is part of uh, when, when you take the bread, you're, you're receiving the body of Christ. And when you take the cup, you're receiving uh, in a symbolic way the blood of Christ. Um, it's part of how we understand our faith. And, and so after verse 7, we get to one of the arguments uh, with the people who've left the group. In verse 8, the writer says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, there's no record of the group that the writer of 1 John is trying to correct. There are no existing letters or pamphlets or uh, even fragments 
of what this group uh, left behind. So all we have are the arguments against it. Uh, but in some ways, that's enough. That's enough for us. Uh, there's no document that says what he's arguing, and so we have to infer uh, what he's saying. We have to infer from what he's saying. Um, clearly, this group that left thinks it can have a sinless life apart from the forgiveness that can only come from Christ. Clearly, this group that left believes that it can have some sort of sinless life apart from the sacrifice of Christ. Okay, now that might sound like a, a hair to split, but that's pretty central to certainly the early Christian message, and it's pretty central to our Christian message. There were groups that believed in the first century that um, that faith was really about having some sort of special secret knowledge. And these people, th this was a, a very influential side group within early Christianity for the first few centuries. Now, if you if if you read in uh, any of the histories about this, th this is the group called the Gnostics. Okay, and that Gnostic starts with a G, G N O S T I C S, and the Gnostics believed that. Uh, that that faith was really built on some secret knowledge that God gave some people. And uh, they had their own creation story that uh, it's a it's a fairly strange story. but um uh, because they believed that only knowledge mattered, and our word for knowledge comes from the same root as Gnostics, even though they look different. Because they believed that, there were two separate groups, even of Gnostics. Because they believed that only the mind mattered, some of them uh, were incredibly strict with their bodies. And because only the mind mattered, they were very rigorous in the way that they kept their bodies pure. The other group within Gnostics, Gnosticism, because only the mind mattered, they did whatever they wanted with their bodies because it, it didn't matter. So there were two groups right around the same time that were talking about um, how we lived and how we conducted ourselves. And either one of them could have been the target group for John's letter. Because what John is saying is, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth isn't in us. Then the writer reminds the, the community that the rhythm of the life of faith is repentance and forgiveness. It's one of the reasons in our own worship patterns, we say together a prayer of confession every Sunday. Because confession and hearing the words of forgiveness are, uh, they're the engine of what we do. Otherwise, we would be too burdened down with guilt, or we would live in denial that we had done anything that needed to be forgiven in the first place. That makes sense? So the writer reminds the Johannine community that the rhythm of the life of faith is is uh, confession and forgiveness. And he says this, this is probably the other best known passage from 1 John. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So th that's... Th that's the writer reminding people that we don't expect you to do this perfectly, but part of the rhythm of the life of faith is that as you seek to serve God, and as you find yourself straying from the path, confession restores us to the path. Confession and repentance and forgiveness, uh, that cycle, that restores us 
to the path of the of the journey of faith. And then just to be clear at the end, the, the writer adds another poke at the group that left. He adds, if we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Pretty harsh words there. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar and his word is not in us. When we claim that we haven't sinned, we miss the point in a few ways. And I think this is part of 1 John that still speaks to us in the contemporary church, that still reminds us that there is a rhythm to the life of faith. Uh, it's all the good things that we talk about, fellowship and worship and discipleship and mission and all the different ways that we serve each other and the community around us and the wider world. It is definitely all of that. But the engine that allows us to continually come back after our mistakes or our sins or our failures or our brokenness, the, the engine that drives that renewal process is confession and forgiveness. And so when we claim that we have not sinned, there's three things that happen. First, we show that we lack self-awareness. There's there there is nobody here, not not the best or purest among us, that isn't somehow separated from God by something we have done. And and that's that's a much more helpful definition of sin than just listing behaviors that we aren't supposed to do. The things we do that get in the way between us and God, that's that's what the Bible's talking about when it talks about sin. And so when we say that we haven't sinned or that we don't sin, or uh, if, if we had the 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 chutzpah to say we don't have the capacity to sin, we lack self awareness. Um, and so, second in the in this passage, what happens when we do that? When we claim that we haven't sinned, we make God out to be a liar, because God has given us this free will, but also acknowledges that we're not always going to use it well. But rather than leave us in that pit. God provides uh, a, a pathway, a, a rhythm of confession and repentance and restoration. And then finally, when we say that we haven't sinned, we erase part of the reason that Jesus came in the first place, part of the reason that he lived and loved and ultimately sacrificed himself for us. And so this idea that any of us uh, live this life without um, straying from exactly what God uh, calls us and wants from us and wants us to do. Uh, when when we say we haven't sinned, we the the language here is harsh, but it shows that we don't know ourselves very well. It shows that we don't know God very well, and it shows that we somehow devalue what Jesus came to do in the first place. That would destroy any church. And it and it did damage to this community then. It does damage to communities now because when we um, when when we don't have an awareness of our own need for God's forgiveness, we choose other things to fight about. We choose other things to divide over. When we're not focused on the bullseye, we end up focusing out on the margins. And so I think I've told you that I, I was a part of a church that took two and a half years to choose a paint color. Uh, anybody who's been in church for a long time has been in one of those conversations. Uh, another church could not decide what color to carpet the sanctuary in. And, uh, and people were angry in that conversation. 
So I think some of the things that churches end up having conflict over and even dividing over, certainly the things that lead people within the family of faith to treat each other poorly are because we don't have our eye on the ball. And I think that's what the author of 1 John is saying, too. The threat to the early church from the people who split and started teaching something different about who Jesus was and something different about our need for forgiveness, that threat to the early church, that was a serious threat. It threatened right from the get-go, within the first century of the church's existence, to change the entire message of why Jesus came and what the church was all about. Without believing that we need healing and reconciliation, we reject the Jesus who came to be the healer and the reconciler. So if we don't think we need healing and reconciliation, we really don't have much acceptance for the, the, uh, the healing and reconciliation that Jesus offers. And so... I will, I will humbly say that there is a lesson for us here, too. We can forget that we need the forgiveness that Jesus came to offer. We can make the same mistake as the group that split from the Johannine community. Mostly, that's a problem of self-awareness. We've all been around people who think that they bet they're better and purer than they really are. Sometimes we've been those people. But when we do it, we miss something that God clearly wants for us to know. It's not that we're bad people and that we deserve punishment. It's that we're broken people who need forgiveness and healing. In the end, I think the writer of 1 John is reminding us to claim the forgiveness and the healing and the renewal and the restoration that God offers us, and to use his words to continue to walk in the light. I'm going to unmute you, and we can have some conversation about that. If you have stuff going on in the background, if you could close a door or turn it down, that would help everybody. So what do you think about First John so far? I wish I heard the rebuttal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the positive person in me wants to think that some of those folks would have been reminded by this letter uh, of what, what had drawn them together in the first place. And I, I think, you know, we're, listen, folks, we're in the reconciliation business. And so uh, if we can't all be reminded of our original faith and uh, and 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 give that a chance to draw us back together, uh, then we're in the wrong place. You got better things to do with a Thursday evening. Uh, so, yeah, I would have loved to have heard how that conversation went back then but i also think um there there's there's plenty there for us to kind of deduce from it and also to to hear uh, for ourselves yeah dale please i mean seriously some people thought they were sinless um i can imagine maybe people having that as a goal with the, the more legalistic people wanting to do every everything in just this right way and all that and so that i i'm i'm free of sin but but i, I it's hard to imagine anybody thought they could accomplish that yeah uh any, anybody here grow up methodist any any methodist here judy yep uh, uh any any awareness of uh wesley's teaching on perfection actually i left the methodist church when I was in junior high and became a Presbyterian. So okay. <laughs> all of that would have escaped me at that no, younger no, age. Nothing <laughs> enhances your understanding of sin like junior high. 
um, there is a strain of uh, post-Reformation Protestant Christianity that talks about living the uh, per uh, achieving perfect uh, the perfect life, and um, it, it was. It, it was then and will forever be a stumbling block in any kind of unity among uh, Wesleyans, Meth Methodists, and uh, and Presbyterians who who lean in varying degrees more Calvinist on that. John, yes, please. Is, sir. When um, when I was growing up uh, in the Church of Christ, which is fundamental. Mm. Uh, the fact that they believe that they're the only church going to heaven, anybody else is going to hell, oh. just didn't fit. Just I couldn't believe that one minute. Yeah, but everybody really believed that. And when you believe you're the only one who know, who know God, it, it's pitiful. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's uh, there are a handful of uh, Protestant traditions. Uh, who believe they're the one true church mm -hmm. uh, until Vatican II, which happened in the early sixties, the Roman Catholic church believed it was the one true church. Uh, it, it was only after Vatican II, in other words, the second Vatican council that happened in the early sixties, where Roman Catholicism uh, went uh, through a, a massive updating conversation it's when the mass started being said in the local language instead in Latin, uh, instead of Latin, and and all kinds of other changes. But one of them was that they embraced uh, the the Christian journey of people who were not Roman Catholic. Um, so yeah, there's there's uh, I don't know how you say you're the one true church. I uh, you know half the time it's hard enough just to convince myself that I'm. I, I'm a Christian of any kind. It's it's hard to imagine saying that I'm part of the one true church, right? I mean, faith's a struggle. It, this is one of the things, uh, I'll just tell you now, because we'll have four more sessions on this letter. Uh, one of the things that makes me a little uncomfortable is how sure the writer of First John is. Uh, I I have a an allergy to certainty. <laughs> Good for you. And so the uh, I think, um, and and of course, the writer of First John is saying, if you stray from the faith as we understand it, because through the Gospel of John, then you've strayed outside the faith. Well, we know that not to be true, because we have Matthew and Mark and Luke and Paul's letters and the Acts of the Apostles. We have these other books that round out our understanding of uh, of the Christian faith. Uh, but this person is setting up some pretty stiff boundaries on the outside of the faith um, and, uh, and really calling out people who go beyond those boundaries. John, I can remember yeah. both in Palmdale and in Laverne, we had a, in the community and infused into our church this idea that if you didn't have the, the speaking in tongues experience, you haven't quite arrived. Yeah. That, that, that was a level of, of like, uh, you, you say, the Methodist perfectionism. Yeah. You didn't have that. And, and, and of course, Paul, he starts his, his uh, 1 Corinthians 13, even though I have the tongues. If I don't have love, he was combating that. Yeah. People use that to prove that, particularly get into chapter 14. It's just amazing. Yeah. And yeah. I, I know we struggled with that. But uh yeah, and 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 I remember uh, uh Vic Pence, and he was a great preacher, and he mm -hmm. followed me at in Laverne, and he became the pastor of the largest Presbyterian church in the United States. But yeah. I talked to him about that issue. He said, that doesn't bother me, you know, because there's different, different, different ways of looking at things, but it was a problem. Yeah. So it's there's a fighting problem. Here, here's, here's something for us as, as, as people who are Christians in the Protestant tradition, here's, 
here's something we lost by leaving uh, the the Roman Catholic tradition is now there's no final authority for any of us. So what we have created in the last 500 years is a free market version of Christianity where sometimes the loudest voice wins, sometimes the most the, the, the most gifted speaker wins or, uh, you know, the, the tradition that has what this music or that music, you know, there's all kinds of things apart from the central ideas and beliefs of Christianity that that lead these traditions or churches to grow. And one of the one of the things that the Roman Catholic Church does, it's just, it provides a hedge on that. <laughs> There are gifted Roman Catholic preachers, but most people are a part of it because it is this consistent, um, and it may believe things that you don't believe or want to believe, and and I don't have any problem with that. But there's uh, one, one historian of American Christianity said that the reason American churches keep splitting and starting new churches and five people will leave a church and start their own church and and all this it, is is that we don't have the the um the final authority of a pope and so somebody in a presbyterian church can read a book about the charismatic revival in the 70s and all of a sudden decide that you can't be a faithful presbyterian unless you speak in tongues when that's not, I mean, if you read the Presbyterian book instead of the other guy's book, you'd probably realize that's not the case. But yeah, so First John's an interest. I mean, I'm I chose it because it felt manageable, but it is it's challenging me in in uh, in some some unexpected ways because it's rigidly defending something that we all know isn't the case. Not about who Jesus is, but about there being only this one set of words and phrases that describe who Jesus is. The writer of 1 John is, uh, is making the case that only the way that the Gospel of John describes Jesus is, is the true faith. And uh, and we we know that not to be the case. That was yeah. giving me trouble too. The uh, if if I understand what you're saying, that it's like defending a metaphor that Jesus or that um, God is the light, and you got to believe the light, and not you can't say God is a flower or <laughs> a moon or what. You, you've got to have the that particular metaphor. Yeah. And and similarly. The blood of Christ fixed our sin. I can understand that as a metaphor, but I have trouble with it if it's if it's not meant as a metaphor. Somehow, magically, that blood yeah got rid of my sin. Yeah. So anyway, this whole yeah. metaphor thing is it, it is, and, and metaphors are essential, and they're also. Uh, I don't want to, dangerous is not the right word, but they're, they're also prone to misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. And so um, our language, uh, most of the people, as I look around the screen here, most of us, uh, maybe with the exception of Nellie, have only ever spoken or thought in English. We might have learned another second language, but our our home our home language for the ways that we understand things for the most of the people as I see on here on the screen it's English, and so we the the ways that English describes God and Jesus and and um, the saving reconciling work of Christ and the idea of blood. Uh, all of that, that works for us in English, but every language has its own set of words that that make that message clear. So you wouldn't want to force 
and I'm I'm afraid the church did this for a long time. You wouldn't want to force the 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 essentials of one language on a culture that didn't speak that language. Uh, that 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 would be that would be unfair. Um, when we were doing the creeds, you guys remember the uh, the Maasai Creed? It was a um, a Christian statement of faith from the point of view of the Maasai tribe in Kenya, and they you know they mention hyenas. They mention the safari. They mention all these things that, you know, I grew up in Burbank. We didn't go on safari. We rode our skateboards and, you know, we did things like that. Um, and there were no hyenas. We had coyotes come down from the mountain. But the, uh, but it was written, it was a statement of faith written in a way that they understood. And if they understood it, then they could communicate it to other people. And so, um, yeah. So anyway, there, there's a whole, there's a whole way that language is is liberates us and constrains us, right? It's like bumpers on a, and when you go bowling and you're not very good, and they put the bumpers up on the lanes. Nobody has to admit to bowling that way, but uh, <laughs> language does that. It keeps us from going in the gutter. There's a nice image for us. You mean those bumpers are removable? <laughs> yes, yes, Tad. Some people don't don't bowl with those. <laughs> but just so that I, I don't want to, I don't want to get. I, I don't think we're in a tangent. I think we've taken one part of this and gone very deep on it. But I, what I don't want to get away from is this idea that the the writer of First John is correct. He's right when he says uh, this this rhythm of confession and forgiveness is what keeps you connected to God and with each other. John, That's when I was when I was growing up in the church, we also had people that came forward and they asked at the end of the service, is there anybody that wants to come and confess? And there was always somebody that came back yeah. down and, and said, this is what I did wrong this week, and I ask God's forgiveness and you mm. your forgiveness. Mm. And that disappeared, and you know, I can't remember when it disappeared. Yeah, I mean, it's so, uh, it, there's part of that that's beautiful, right? If in a, in a tightly knit community, if you've got something to say sorry about, we, we need to provide a way for that to happen. But you can also see how that, you know, a a, per, a vulnerable person yeah. could confess something that would put them, their own sort of mind and heart at risk. And, uh, but confession itself, you know, one of the things that uh, the, the Protestant reformers didn't like about Roman Catholicism is that people went to confession. Well, I will tell you that when I was a seminary student, I went to my 10-year high school reunion. I was 28 years old. And in the little book that said what every all of us had been doing with the last 10 years of our life since high school, it said that I was in training to be a minister. It didn't even say I was a minister. It said I was in training to be a minister. Here's what I can tell you about my 10-year reunion. I heard confession all night. I did. I had people drop no, by people, people I didn't know in high school. I had a, 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 you know, a woman, a young woman that I knew. We had gone to middle school and high school together, not seen each other since then. She came up and confessed something very personal and very private to her. Uh, and I, I hardly got up from my table like while people were dancing or hobnobbing and taking pictures, uh, I probably heard four or five confessions that night mm. Mm. from people who didn't go to church. Mm. They just thought, oh, I remember John from sixth grade. I'll go confess to him. <laughs> people, people want, people want, mm. that's probably not strong enough. 
people need a place to come clean. And they need to be told the words that they're okay. Yeah. And we do it as a liturgy on Sunday, but that's not the only time any of us should confess. It's an opportunity for us to confess as a community, but uh, but I think people, I know I do, uh, people need to, uh, to have a place where they can come clean. And it's one of the things we lost in the Reformation. So. Anybody else, anything strike you, Jack? I have to second that because I've had so many people come to me in my office and confess. And I mean, things you couldn't believe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I know I would have, <laughs> talk about metaphors, but I say, well, if we believe in God and we believe that God forgives us, then that, that, that's not make a God a liar. Yeah. I, I would do whatever I could to get them on the other side. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It is a thing about pastors and deacons and uh, de depending on the church and the way that that some elders are involved in ministry, uh, the people the people who listen, who have that role of listening within the church, carry a huge burden. Yeah. Well, I, I had in, in Palmdale, this girl approached me and our youth director. He was a student at Fuller, Bruce. And she wanted to confess. And so we had to go to the sanctuary. She wanted the lights darkened. Mm. We knelt and she confessed. And we explained that God forgave her. And, mm. and then her mother later, that changed her life. Mm. But she had to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. I think maybe the writer of First John <laughs> is afraid that if that teaching was diluted somehow by this group that left, that people would miss out on that opportunity to come clean. That people would miss out on that thing that they need uh, and were being told that they didn't need it. Um, and, and, and as I say those words, I wanna say this, the contemporary church tells people Oh, you don't have to apologize for that. Yeah. Everything's okay. And it's not okay. It's not okay. I'm I don't know. I, I would never be want to be the one who makes up the list of what's okay and what's not okay. That's for other people. That's for God to do. And that's what that's for us to work out in our own hearts with God. But I I think this generation and the last couple of generations of local churches like ours, we've done a disservice to people by telling them, oh, don't worry about that. That's not wrong. And we've allowed them to wound themselves and wound other people. Uh, and so that, that's, a, that's a tough thing. But I think it's a true thing. Sorry. Go ahead, Kathy. I, I, I think that it's so important to be reminded to have that self-awareness because otherwise people tend to bury their feelings and their shame or their guilt and it, it comes out in, in other very destructive ways for for others and for yeah. ourselves and i yeah. i think that that self-awareness is um we need to search for that constantly yeah yeah and uh, listen i know that it's the job of the church to to provide that space for people to do that, but it's very difficult to do. It's well, the church difficult. can often be thought of as this is a place for for the good people, and so yeah. we don't want to talk about bad stuff because yeah, we're not supposed to admit that. Yeah. Well, and trust is so hard to come by. Yeah. Yeah, trust is hard because trust is hard anyway. And then church life sometimes makes trust even harder because, you know, the longer you're with a group of human people, the more likely it is you got a list of ways you've been wounded. 
and those wounds make it hard to trust. And I also think that there are people who have certain beliefs about what, what Christianity is and feel uh, that they're not worthy uh, and that mm -hmm. they're going to be seen in a, they're going to be judged in a very negative way yeah. because those right, those other people who go to church have a way of thinking that they're not going to understand me or accept yeah. me or love me. Yeah. It's that, that may be, uh, I got to tell you, Kathy, I'll tell all of you, I think about that, what you said, I think about that every week that I've been a pastor because uh, it is the opposite of what we're supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. The very first sermon I ever preached, I was 16, <laughs> my uh, maybe 18. It was youth Sunday. I'm getting too mixed up, but I think I was 18 or 19. My parents were separating and going through a divorce mm -hmm. and um Neither of them felt comfortable coming to church and talking about it. And both of them felt let down by the church, by people that they loved. Mm -hmm. And so the first sermon I ever preached was called, Is This a Hospital or a Health Club? Mm -hmm. And it was the passage where Jesus says, it's, it's not the healthy that come for me, it's the sick. Mm -hmm. And... uh yeah, it's just that has been, I think that's what the writer of First John is trying to prevent. If you get a bunch of people who don't think they need God, then what's the point of convening them and gathering in the first place? And uh, folks, we're, you know, as we look at the wider church, but this is not just other people's problem. This is our problem. Um, we, we I, I don't know that all of us come. I don't know that I come to church with an awareness of my need for God. So I'll make this about me because that's true. <laughs> uh, I, I am not convinced that I regularly come to church aware that I need God. And that I don't think that's you know I'm 61 I'm I'm still trying to figure this part out so I'm 61 and people have been paying me to do this for a long time and I'm still trying to figure it out so back to what Kathy said I Barbara Haddon one time said something that resonated she was talking to a pastor from an inner city black church and his his sermons lasted an hour and a half two hours. And Barbara said, I couldn't get my congregation to stay that long. <laughs> and he explained to her, he says, I may have to spend an hour convincing them they're worthy of God's love. Huh. Wow. Uh, and, you know, yeah, that, that, that hurts me that yeah. there's people that, you know, but, but like your parents, they went through that where they apparently didn't feel they were worthy of mm -hmm when they needed it most. Yeah. 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 Jack? In First John, uh, that we have to recognize that we sin. And I know through uh, uh, years of pastoral counseling, and I, I have encountered individuals that come in and they're, they feel sorry or they feel bad. And I hear them and I, I don't say to them, Oh, you're okay, like you say. I say, yes, you ought to feel bad. <laughs> but then you go from there. Yeah, of course. You ought it's, to feel bad. Yeah. This is business of, oh, it's okay. No, it isn't okay. Yeah. The, the church got out of the habit of talking about sin. <laughs> and then it tried to reclaim it. And it reclaimed it in a clumsy way by only talking about sex. <laughs> And so, uh, which which just ruined another generation of people. Uh, but if you if you actually if you look in the actual Bible, that, I'm going to come back to that phrase that I started using a couple of years ago. The actual Bible, the one that we that is our that is our governing document and our founding papers. Um, 
we see all kinds of things that get defined as sin and very few of them have to do with human sexuality uh they there are you know we we sin collectively when we aren't people we, when we're in a group and we and we somehow shun another group we we sin individually when we deprive somebody of something they're entitled to something we have the power to provide uh and there's all kinds of things like that you know it's funny people talk about sex all the time they never talk about gluttony <laughs> <laughs> but it shows up way more times. And I'm not talking about weight. I'm talking about uh, the fact that I, I never eat two cookies. I get the cookies off the shelf. I've made that investment. I'm going to eat 10. <laughs> and and so anyway, and, and that's not good for me. You know what I mean? These things that that God calls sin... Some of them are much smaller than we make them out to be, and they're not they're not death sentences. They're you're not taking good care of yourself. You are not um, preserving and loving this shrine that I have given you called your body, this temple I have given you called your body. And if you don't love yourself, how are you going to love your neighbor? Right now we're back to the core commands. So anyway, uh, I, this is a this is a bit of a rant, but this is this is this is what's this is what First John is prompting a little bit. So we'll do some more line by line, and we'll look at these arguments. But we're going to talk more about what these things mean for us. So we are on next week. And then we take one week off. That next Thursday is 4th of July. And then we'll resume again for another three Thursdays. Okay. So um, the Kurt, Illing Kurt Illingworth service is at 2 o'clock on Saturday. If that's something, if you knew Kurt and want to remember him that way. Uh, otherwise, I will see you all on Sunday. Could I could I say something? Please. Please. Um, we, you know, we're interviewing people uh, for the 150th anniversary. We interviewed Kurt Illingworth first. Mm. So we have his. Uh, that's beautiful. And and we were going to try to get back, but we didn't make it. So, yeah, that's all. I'm glad you, I'm glad you got him. That That's uh, that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, let me close this in prayer. God, thank you for the ways that you have provided for us on this journey of learning what it means to follow you, for the ways that you remind us uh, to love ourselves so that we know how to love other people, for the ways that you allow us to confess and to start over. We thank you that you are a God of the do-over. And as we continue in this journey through First John, uh, we pray that you'd continue to show us ways that we can start over and start again being your disciples. Uh, we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Thanks, everybody. John. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, John. John. Thanks, Thank John. You, John. Yeah. John? Yes, sir. Uh, a thought, uh, I'm scared I'll forget it. Joanne, uh, Jim Nielsen's sister. Maston. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems like somebody ought to talk to her about the physical layout of the church when they were growing up. Mm -hmm. The Sunday school was in the church. Oh, you mean for the history project? Yeah. 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 I, but I, I, you know, it dawned on me, at Jim's, uh, the pastor's office was in that little square. Yeah. You know, somebody... It seems like the history should, what was the church like originally? And, yeah. and I'm sure Joanne would know, but I would don't think many other people would. Would you send me that as an email and I'll make sure it gets to the right person? Okay, will do. That'd be good. That'd be good. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Have a good evening. Good night.